making sure that we can sort of get the most out of their perspective and help them uh, as they're setting up goals for their organizations around embodied carbon, MEP systems, et cetera. So uh, with that, I'm going to I'm going to keep the welcome there. I'm going to start sharing some. Uh, I'm going to share my screen very soon, and then we're going to launch into some presentations. Um, so if anybody does have any comments or questions, the rest of the steering committee is going to be helping to monitor the chat. I will not have that uh, once I'm once I've got everything going here. I've only got one screen, um, so if I do need to be corrected, somebody's going to have to shout. I hope that's all right. Um, I think Mr. Shin is probably not going to mind shouting, so I'll give him that role. All right, everyone got the screen. Somebody give me a, a shout. Yes. 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 Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome again. Here is our agenda. Uh, this roundtable is not going to be 45 minutes. It's going to be about a half an hour instead, uh, and then we're going to have but we're still going to get through everything that's on the, this agenda. Welcome. Uh, if anybody's. Sorry, say that again. Oh, I see. Sorry, everyone. Teams has this lovely feature when if somebody is joining by phone, it announces their name. And I don't know how to turn that off. So if somebody does, please give me that tip in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I would say. <laughs> if you are new and you've not been to a forum yet, please also uh, introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to know where you're coming from and uh, what you're most interested in getting out of your, your participation in the MEP 2040 initiative. Uh, just a reminder here that the challenge that was issued by the Carbon Leadership Forum uh, is to advocate for and achieve zero carbon in our projects. Uh, and the commitment that we've made as signatories uh, and and hopefully by corresponding relationship from supporters uh, is to. Uh, one, establish a company plan two request low GWP refrigerants, three request EPDs and. And four participate in the quarterly MEP 2040 forum. So here we are forum number three, uh, the list of signatories and supporters is growing. Please do continue to spread the word. Uh, the more the merrier and the aspiration here is to help us get, all get on the same page uh, with uh, not only ourselves, but also with other organizations like Architecture 2030, SE 2050, and making sure that while we have our discipline specific forums, we also have connection to all of the other efforts that are going on and we can do more together. Uh, and also a massive shout out and a huge thank you to the folks who are on the screen right now as the steering committee for MEP 2040. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into the working groups, a ton of work that goes into the forums um, and just an amazing amount of passion and commitment for this topic in this space. So thank you. Thank you to everyone on the steering committee. I'm, I couldn't be prouder of the work that we've been able to do so far and very excited about everything to come. So with that, we're going to shift over to the two owners that we have joining us today. Uh, I would like to pass the mic to Anthony, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yes, good day. Uh, my name is Anthony Bernheim. I am uh, for the last nine years. I've been the healthy um, and resilient buildings program manager at San Francisco International, and I manage two programs. One is the uh, sustainability program and one is the commissioning activation program for all new projects at the airport. Thank you. Fantastic. Anthony, thank you for joining us. I'll hand you the mic back uh, shortly. Um, secondly, Mr. Don Horn, if you could also introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Don Horn, uh, an architect with the GSA Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings. I've been with GSA for quite some time now working with sustainability since 1999 and uh, that's enough for to now for now yeah super i am um, a, a little bit of a, a tangent here i i'm so happy to see both of you here uh, for for two reasons number one the very first embodied carbon study that i did was for the mercedes-benz stadium in atlanta 
And uh, shortly after completing that, we got a call from some folks who are going to be working on the, a new project at SFO. At SFO. And uh, we ended up sharing some of the work that we had done on that stadium with a crowd of folks at FS, SS, SFO as a large project doing an embodied carbon study. Julia, you're on mute. Muted. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Secondly, uh, the overlap with GSA is is not full circle in terms of something that happened 10 years ago, but instead full circle from a conversation that I had yesterday at a facilities and campus energy planning conference in DC. And uh, Don, I met Kevin, last name K. I will not attempt to pronounce the last name, but we had a great conversation about embodied carbon, and he shared a lot of um, of really helpful insight in terms of what GSA has been trying to do and how they're thinking about moving forward with some of the um, the funding that's coming through, which uh, which we're also going to touch on later. So, really thankful for both of you to be here. And um, before we launch into the presentations that you guys have, I was hoping to also understand if there are any other building owners or owner representatives on the call. Uh, someone from Amazon put their hand up while we were on Zoom previously. So if you wouldn't mind reintroducing yourself and then if there's anybody else, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, vocally or in the chat. All right, I will take that as a sign of either chat or not a lot of owners on the call. Fantastic. Anthony, could I, would you like to take the screen? Julie, we do have a hand up of Sarah Hatem in the chat. Not sure if you wanted to introduce yourself. Yes, please, Sarah, go ahead. Sarah, if you are speaking, you are on mute. You used it too. <laughs> all right, that's all right. We will come back to that once we get into the round table to see if anybody else would like to introduce themselves. Um, thanks for that, Kaylee. Anthony, would you like to take the screen? So good day to everybody. Um, just checking that you can A, hear me and B, see my screen. All good. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Very briefly touch on building decarbonization work that we're doing in San Francisco International Airport. Uh, we are governed by a number of industry groups um, and all in the aviation industry to set net zero goals. And we also obviously have a very aware climate, uh, climate aware public in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the Air International Air Transport Association um, and the Airports Council International have both set goals of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So we are uh, tracking those goals and figuring out how to achieve them. Um, there is the airport carbon accreditation standard that we use for at least um, scopes one and two. We have uh, built our own airport strategic plan, which sets goals internally for us. And we have uh, followed our local codes, which are quite restrictive uh, in San Francisco and California. And we've built some standards, which I will touch on in a moment, uh, that are also quite rigorous uh, and require a significant amount of work by our mechanical engineers and, and our other contractors uh, to conform. So the airport's carbon footprint comp uh, comprises a number of different types of emissions. Some of, the, of those are in our control, some of them are not. I'm going to focus primarily on scope three emissions uh, and primarily on purchased goods and services, i.e. the materials and equipment that we put into our buildings that we purchase. Uh, so that's the focus of this very short presentation. 
Um, we have a goal of reducing our uh, carbon and embodied uh, in, uh, and our energy reduction at this airport uh, from a um, use of carbon, uh, sorry, a use of energy perspective. We are planning a heat recovery chiller plant, uh, and we will be expecting the engineers that design that chiller plant to bring us a very highly efficient uh, plant that will supply uh, energy to uh, the terminal buildings and some of our office buildings. Um, and it, again, our mechanical engineers will be asked to provide zero net energy ready new construction. It's more complicated on some of our buildings because we're a 24 seven operation uh, and we have limited space on a very tight airport to provide renewable energy sources such as photovoltaic panels. Um, we are developing an energy monitoring uh, system and we are also we have developed a an ongoing commissioning program for new new buildings and for existing buildings. Uh, and we are figuring out now how to upgrade our existing buildings uh, to bring uh, all electric uh, power to those buildings uh, and all electric equipment. So there's a tremendous amount of work coming up at this airport for architects, mechanical engineers and contractors. Um, in, in a more specific level, we are focusing on carbon neutrality, reducing our scope one and two um, carbon emissions, but we are also focusing on our buildings, and that's what I'm going to focus on coming up now with a net zero carbon goal by 2030, which is ahead of the industry standards. So by um, November last year, we had built and got approved by the uh, Airport Standards uh, Committee um, our new sustainable planning design and construction standards. What's important here, and I'm going to focus on today, are the energy and carbon uh, chapter and the materials and resources chapter. And where energy and carbon used to be the, the focus of the MEP engineers, now we are asking them to focus on materials and resources from an embodied carbon perspective. Um, we set requirements and then we set stretch goals that are um, reach and regenerative. So it's basically good, better, best. So when, when a mechanical engineer comes to work for us at this airport uh, and starts to design the systems uh, that are going to go into our buildings, there are requirements that are good and then there are better and best goals that we're asking them to achieve. From an energy perspective, we have set um, ZNE targets, EUI targets for all different types of building uh, uses at this airport. And these are the uh, the standards that we expect buildings to adhere to or to better to get better than. Uh, and many of these uh, include process loads, particularly for the concourses where we provide power and heating and cooling uh, to the aircraft and to baggage handling systems. So these are quite aggressive standards that we put in place. Uh, on the materials and resources chapter, we've set some very aggressive standards for concrete using a carbon star rating of 200 zero for reach and minus 200 pounds per cubic yard uh, for regenerative. Um, and then we are asking for a whole building disclosure using the lead guidelines. Um, so we have a requirement to reach the lead standards um, and then to do better than the lead standards for a reach goal. And I put in italics down below um, the MEP guidance because this is not yet in there, but it is something it is, some, it is the standard that we're about to build. Right now, we would base that standard on uh, the work we're doing with EC3, the embodied carbon in uh, construction calculator using EPDs. Uh, but what we learn from the 2040 uh, group may impact how we actually develop this new requirement. So this is a work in progress and we are eager to learn what's coming next. We have built a template in EC3 for the airport for our building projects, for our infrastructure projects, projects, and for our tenant projects. We have started to input some of the projects. Our Harvey Milk Terminal 1 project is in there. And what we are looking at right now is um, looking at the achievable goals for the buildings and for the products uh, and for the MEP equipment and the conservative. And we're trying to be well be above the conservative goals for carbon, um, uh, embodied carbon, and getting closer to the achievable goals. And I show you one of the maps of one of our, uh, our Harvey Milk Terminal 1, and below I have put in one of the um, mechanical equipment uh, EPDs that we have found on the system, Dakin, which is one of the 
equipment that we're current or piece of equipment that we're currently using at this airport. So this is where we are right now. This is the guidance we're using. Uh, we are already advertising or marketing to our tenants and, and to our passengers that our emissions are decreasing at this airport. Um, and we are hoping to learn a lot more from uh, 2040 so that we can actually adjust and modify our standards going forward. So this is where we are today. Thank you. Anthony, thank you so much. If anybody does have questions as the folks are presenting, please do feel free to put those in the chat and we'll come back to them uh, after both have had a chance to present. Don, would you like to take the screen? Great, Don, we see your screen and just a reminder to take yourself off mute. I find I can't do two things at once. So <laughs> <laughs> now I'm off mute. I'll go back to sharing my screen. Super, thank Sorry you. About that. No worries. Okay. Yes, I am very happy to join you today. This is great. I hope to learn more than I actually uh, impart to you all. So uh, you're familiar with GSA, I'm sure. Uh, I like to think of GSA as a solution provider for other agencies. That's kind of what we do, procurement, real estate, technology, and other operational support services. Uh, and GSA has been a leader in federal sustainability since 1999 when I started with the program. Uh, but with our real estate portfolio of more than 370 million rentable square feet, a non-tactical vehicle fleet of more than 450,000 vehicles and leasing services for another 226,000 vehicles, uh, GSA also has uh, oversees approximately 75 billion in annual contracts and is a primary agency in government-wide electricity procurement. So that really positions GSA to be a unique part of the solution of the current goals for the, for the administration. Uh, there are some links there to some of our publicly reporting uh, things through federal reporting requirements. So I'm gonna just uh, breeze through a, a bunch of different uh, uh, concepts here, oops, and uh, try to just give an overview and then we can discuss later if you have other questions. So in December, this administration came out with the federal sustainability plan along with executive order 14057. And it is the most ambitious I've ever seen for the federal government. It, it really is amazing uh, the targets that we have to, to meet net zero emissions uh, operations by 2050. So here's the different components. Uh, primarily, I guess, net zero emissions buildings by 2045 and procurement by 2050. And they're trying to really make this stick now. So to make the uh, 2020s kind of the decade of action, these are some more near-term goals that we have. So for buildings, 50% emissions reduction by 2032. And now uh, with procurement uh, requiring supplier disclosure and a new federal buy clean initiative, which actually is being announced right now today in Toledo. So uh, look for press releases and things from the White House about that or from the federal environmental uh, executive. So GSA really started looking at this in February 2021. What, our Green Building Advisory Committee, actually they studied the issue in 2020 and then in 2021, they uh, issued a, an advice letter to us, to our Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings uh, recommending, well, they had an a entire letter of uh, information and background, but then there were two primary ad advice uh, or recommendations from that to look at a material approach uh, to ask for lots of environmental product declarations and try to select those that are in the best performing 80%. And then also to do whole building life cycle assessment and look for a 20% carbon reduction. So that led to a roundtable that we held and other industry engagement. And 
the public building service and the rest of GSA, we developed a embodied carbon task group. We've been meeting weekly ever since then and have uh, accomplished quite a bit. So in March, we issued new concrete and asphalt standards. That originally, we were thinking they would just be for the bipartisan infrastructure law for our border station projects. But then we said, you know, well, why not? This should be for all projects. So it is a supplement to the facility standards for GSA and does apply to all of our projects now. I won't go into details, but um, it's really asking for EPDs and for asphalt since there aren't that many in the market. Uh, we have some other uh, environmentally preferable attributes that would be could be met, but we're moving towards asking or, or getting the EPDs there as well. Then we also have a new performance measure, embodied carbon reduction measure. And so all of our new projects moving forward have to target a 20% reduction in embodied carbon. And so this is active now, as I said, there are a few projects working on it, but uh, it'll have a bigger impact in the couple of years coming ahead. And we are also using the LEED uh, building life cycle impact reduction credit and uh, measuring from there. So of most interest probably, and I, I understand that Josh will be talking about this in a minute, but the Inflation Reduction Act was signed in August. And uh, there are three primary provisions that affect GSA. Uh, one section, assistance for federal buildings, is uh, converting facilities to high performance green buildings. This is very similar to what uh, was required under the Recovery Act uh, back in 2009. And the second section, use of low carbon materials, uh, inquiring and installing materials and products for construction of our GSA buildings that have substantially lower levels of embodied greenhouse gas emissions. The third part is for emerging and sustainable technologies and does relate to some programs as well. But the big challenge for GSA now that we are working through is what does all this mean? How does this all relate to the executive order goals and uh, other administration priorities and uh, exactly what GSA's role is. So uh, in terms of MEP systems, we're trying to figure that out as well. Uh, exactly how can this play into the decision making, particularly for the section on use of low carbon materials. Uh, materials and products, can products include systems? And if they do, how much of a system? Uh, so what, yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're meeting with many different people, meeting with EPA. EPA has a say in how this is interpreted. But uh, let's see, the, the current federal buy clean initiatives are focused on concrete, steel, asphalt, and flat glass. There will be others in the future, but for us in spending this money, we are interpreting it much bro more broadly and EPA understands that as well and are working with us to uh, make sure it's consistent with what they would like to see as well. So what does GSA need from owners or from others? Uh, EPDs for MEP systems. So we want, as the advice letter said, to ask for EPDs for everything. And EPA emphasizes to us, it's really the EPDs for upstream materials. So what's going into the, the final product? And that's where the greatest impact is and the greatest uh, potential for emissions reduction. Uh, we're also then trying to balance the impacts from operational emissions and embodied emissions. So even with our whole building life cycle assessment approach, approach, we still want to know the embodied emissions of the products or the systems. And we have to ensure that those are lower as well, that it's not, a, a building is not just riding by on operational efficiency, but we're actually getting this in a whole building perspective from the materials as well. So that's what I would like to learn more about from you guys. All right, thanks. Super, excellent. And in, in our agenda, uh, we had originally planned on having a bit of a roundtable discussion, Anthony, with you and Don. Uh, I think what I'd like to do, Josh, if you're okay with it, is to ask you to run through your five-minute IRA overview before we do that, because I do think it's a it's a really important part of what the conversation could be. So let's um let's make that small shift if that's all right with you. Sure, Julie. Yeah, definitely. Um, I believe you've got the slides if you want to pull them back up. I do indeed. I will do that right now. Awesome. Don, Don's, Don's given as much information. I, I also appreciate Don had 
Tom had one of the sections that I did not have because it didn't specifically reference carbon, but I'm very excited that uh, uh, they're seeing it that way. So um, yeah, Julie, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a quick layout for everyone. Obviously there are hours and hours and thousands of hours that, that legal teams are pouring over the law to make sure they understand it as Don said, but some specific positions to call out in, in sections of the Inflation Reduction Act is um, section 60112 is giving $250 million to the EPA for EPD assistance for construction materials. Um, they, they, the money is to be spent by 2031. Um, how this works is, is not fully understood, as Don said, obviously, EPA, GSA, and lots of others in the government are, are trying to work that out and come up with a path. But within this, it's not just for manufacturers. It's also to be given to states, tribes, and nonprofits to help them implement some procurement concepts or, or getting more EPDs into the marketplace. So that's great news in terms of the embodied carbon information that we have in the marketplace. Right after that is section 60116, which gives $100 million or to EPA for low embodied carbon labeling for construction materials. And that needs to be spent by 2026. Now, one interesting thing here is I use the term low embodied carbon because that's typically what we're using in the marketplace. But the, the law itself actually bounces back and forth between the term low carbon and low greenhouse gas. Um, so again, just, you know, legislators, um, we, we love them all to, to help us out here, but sometimes they bounce back and forth between terms, not fully understanding the impact of those terms. So I'm sure GSA and, and EPA and the lawyers are trying to make sure that it's all understood, but I've used low embodied carbon because that's essentially uh, the terminology that we're using. And this is for the labeling, um, understanding in the marketplace, getting the information out to the marketplace so that it can be procured by federal governmental agencies. Again, Don touched on section 60503 and 60504. I don't need to go into much more there. The low carbon materials and emerging technologies are areas that can certainly be talking about lower carbon. Obviously, one specifically talks about that. Um, two more areas, though, that I did want to bring up are 60506 are, are $2 billion for um, federal highway low carbon transportation material grants, while not directly in our realm. I want you to understand that it's not just our construction materials. This is being spread out um, into other areas. So infrastructure uh, and federal highways is really diving into this and working potentially with the, the state highway authorities as well to, to really diversify and get more information. Obviously, some of that um, infrastructure information can be utilized in our worlds as well. Um, and Section 70006 just gives a carpet blanket that FEMA should be pro procuring low carbon materials as well. And again, you have the dates here when these have to be spent. So again, it's FEMA, um, obviously with all of their um, resilient uh, building practices and all of their uh, potentially uh, when they go into disaster areas and provide housing and things of that nature. So this is all being worked out with them as well. Uh, Julie, if you wanna go to the next slide. And again, I know we're flying through this and it's lots of information. Um, as Don said, a lot of it is being figured out from my understanding, talking with the different agencies. But the things to note here are low carbon needs to be defined. Um, as, as Don mentioned, you know, EPA and GSA and all of the other folks in, in government that I've talked with are that's that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, one pathway that that we would certainly suggest is industry-wide environmental product declarations help set that bar, right? Um, much as GSA utilized um uh, information in the marketplace and work with individuals to come up with their concrete global warming potential maximums. There's a way to define what low carbon means in the marketplace and, and there are tools uh, to do that. Um, for those that question whether, you know, environmental impact data uh, and transparency of it was a phase just due to some lead, I think this pretty much tells you that no, you know, $5 billion plus of federal spending will, will make something pretty sticky. Um, and also for discussion point, when I hear people say, well, the election this November or 2024, this is certainly that impacts the executive order, right? Um, the 2024 election will certainly impact executive orders and things of that nature, but this is a law. Um, so dependent, it, not truly dependent on who's elected into office and it would take a significant amount to change this um, in, in future laws, um, even though we've got that 2026 and 2031 coming. 
Um, the last point that I think is is important to recognize for all of us is this is a giant beacon for other authorities having jurisdictions. That's what AHJ uh, terminology is for. Um, at COP last year, you had a numerous amounts of states and cities uh, signing up with the U.S. federal government to basically agree on, okay, if we're going to do something from a sustainability procurement perspective, how do we do it together? So as the federal government starts to come out with these concrete, um, pun not intended, um, pathways for how to do procurement and things like that, you're going to see different states moving as well. California, where I am right now for the Net Zero Conference, is already doing buy low act, uh, uh, buy green, uh, uh, buy clean. Buy clean. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> buy clean legislation. State of Washington has a pilot program. Others are also doing it. So again, this is a very, very large signal to them that, hey, we're going to flood the marketplace with information. Um, and all of that will move forward. So I expect anything that uh, Don does in the future, um, and I'm, I'm playing with Don a little bit there, um, anything the federal government does in the future will certainly make a big signal to the other HGAs. So uh, that's quick. Super. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to all of your lovely faces. I uh, would encourage anyone who's um, willing, able, interested to turn your video on. Uh, we're going to use the next half an hour for a roundtable, hopefully as engaged as possible. Um, I will say, um, and Josh, thank you very much for the overview in terms of how it, the specifics start to tie into the topic of embodied carbon. Um, the conferences that I was just at in Washington, D.C., obviously we're also focused on the impact of the IRA and the other um, funding announcements that have been made. Uh, and I'll say that, you know, the, the RMI and um, AIA, USGBC, all of these organizations are starting to put together uh, webinars and, and um, information to help the design community understand what this funding can mean uh, for our work moving forward, um, particularly in the in the next sort of three to five years as a pretty immediate push. Um, but I'll also say that the Environmental Law Institute, ELI, uh, is a really great resource for a sort of um, slightly up, upstream, broader overview of what all of this looks like and what it means uh, and how the current Biden Harris administration is doing their level best uh, to push as much of this of of this sort of work into as many agencies as possible uh, in terms of environmental justice and climate change. Um, last note, Kim, before I hand the mic to you, is to say that uh, one of the things that I learned is that the, there is this Justice 40 requirement uh, that comes along with all of this funding, which means that 40% of the funding must be spent within uh, environmental justice communities, uh, which is incredibly exciting. So um, populations that are more vulnerable uh, and exposed is, is just, you know, like big round of applause for making sure that that was part of all of the work that's happening right now. So um, Kim, over to you, and then we'll come back to the to questions for the for the group. Um, on the subject of questions from the group, yes. um, I, you'll notice that at the top of the Teams window, there's something called reactions. If if you would raise your hand, like I've done, um, we'll we'll call on you that way. And we got a few questions in uh, the chat window while Anthony and Don were doing their presentation. And I'm going to just quickly read off the one that uh, are the ones that I've seen uh, from Scott Farbman uh, to Don. Uh, GSA's buy clean policy and statement seems to generally say procure low embodied carbon stuff. Are there actual greenhouse gas target requirements? Yeah. And Don, Don, hold that thought for one quick second, if that's OK. Um, and Kim, thank you for that. I did want to take a very quick minute and recognize that we do have um, Mick, and I will not um, mispronounce your last name, from it's the Dalrymple. universe. Thank you, thank you, from the University of South Carolina, USC. So thank you, thank you for joining, and we're interested in your... Southern California. Perspective, sorry, what did I say? 
South Carolina. Oh, it's sorry. another USC, but you know. My brain, folks. I'm so sorry. Um, and then I do believe we still have Andrew from Amazon online as well, who also asked a question in the chat. Um, so if you are on the call and you are an owner or representing an owner, please do put your your names in the chat. We would love to make sure that you're engaged in the discussion. And with that, Kim, thank you. Don, back to you for the question. OK, so uh, we do have targets currently for our concrete uh, standard that we created. Uh, it was based on some work that the New Buildings Institute did and going 20 percent below that. But we find that it's kind of like the National Ready Mix Concrete Association industry average. So it's not that stringent. It's also a national target. I think it's the first time that anyone has tried to do a national target for concrete. We hope to get more regional information. And as we gather more information, we will make our targets more stringent. That's part of this whole learning phase this first year. And same thing with asphalt. We don't have enough EPDs to really figure out what the, that target would be or could be. As far as whole building, we are, we've are we got several initiatives underway to try to develop some whole building targets, but we don't have that data yet either. So we really are in the information gathering stages. Super, Kaylee or Andrew, um, I'm curious if you might have uh, something to share from CLF in terms of what they're trying to do with the whole building database. Uh, this is Andrew um, Himes from CLF, and uh, and I can tell you that we are um, launching a project to develop a whole building LCA database of of uh, hopefully many thousands of of uh, reference buildings that have undergone complete LCA studies, and uh, we're um, we are st we're still in the early stages of that, uh, working with a a bunch of partners including I'm sure companies that some of you are 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 part of and I'll put a link in the chat window to the description of the project um, and you'll be able to see a link there of an email address that you can um, you can send uh, your own interest in being part of the of the research project and potentially participating and contributing data and buildings to it. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. I, I only raised that that note because, Don, I think one of the key goals that CLF has through this forum and others is to try to make as many of those connections as possible so that we're not um, we can all share and not duplicate efforts. Um, Anthony, I think I saw your hand go up very briefly. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I want to um, reinforce what Don had said that the carbon, uh, the concrete industry for various reasons is a little bit of ahead of some of the other industries in terms of decarbonization. Um, I was part of a committee uh, that put together the carbon star rating for concrete. Um, and we are now starting to work with the local concrete suppliers to figure out how to get that carbon star rating that we've set, um, which is going to require the use of various and sundry additives um, and other um, means to get to the very high and restrictive goals we've set. But the question I'm trying to understand is how do we get to a similar kind of rating for the MEP equipment? Um, because that's kind of the focus of, of my thinking this morning. Um, so I just wanted to put out to look at Carbon Star and see if that's a value to you on the one side of the equation. And then, and by the way, that, uh, organi that group uh, that put that together was done for USA and Canada North America, and now it is going international, and we're just starting to work on the uh, ISO certification for that, so that it becomes global. Um, so we need something similar for the MEP equipment. Super, Brittany. <laughs> Brittany so and Kaylee boring. are in the same Her room, so they're gonna. Room. <laughs> awesome, they're gonna share a camera. Hi. All right. Um, this question is for Josh. Hey, Josh. Um, how is the how can the funding under Section 60116 be used? Can that be used to subsidize the cost to manufacturers of getting their products labeled if that's something that might be out of reach for them? Again, a lot of it's being decided, um, Brittany. I, I, I wish, you know, I'm, I'm sure Don wishes he could tell you and the people I've spoken with wish they could tell everybody. 
Um, a lot of it's being decided at the moment um, in terms of, uh, which is why Don mentioned, you know, they're meeting, uh, the, the executive order folks are meeting on a weekly basis. I'm sure there are hourly meetings happening specifically around the Inflation Reduction Act <clears throat> uh, with people that I know. Um, and that it's uh, it, it's not fully understood, Don, unless you have more recent information just earlier this week, um, that, that wasn't completely clear to, to me. Well, one thing that I think is really neat about this is that uh, they really are trying a whole of government comprehensive approach. So there's money for EPA to help with EPDs and help companies, you know, develop on that side. There's a, <clears throat> money for DOE for innovative technologies and really bringing, you know, upgrading plants and bringing things to scale. So, you know, we all have a different role to play and GSAs is just the procurement, but the other DOE and EPA both have money that could help meet with help to uh, meet those needs. Yeah, I, the way I read it, Brittany, is that the my my best guess is that the EPA would be the the source of that money, and and it's up to them to decide how they want to use it, and how much of it may or may not go to to private companies to support the the work of the work that they need to do to actually produce the EPDs. Right. Okay. Thank you, Haley. Uh, I want to read. Oh, uh, sorry. I want to quickly. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Luke. I yeah, I want to quickly respond to Anthony's question and also solicit the wise opinion of other people on this topic. Uh, a few things that we can get to the MEP kind of standard. One thing is S-Ray 240P, uh, the whole life carbon standard. It will address some of these MEP questions, including some of the benchmarking. The other exciting thing I think is the ICC and S-Ray is going to issue a global whole life carbon poll. So that could be another avenue to address that. I think the procedure or the steps will be first to be able to address the things maybe we know better, like the refrigerant, the GWP. I think that could be a low hanging fruit. But there are already, uh, the other effort is we are uh, close to um, working with SIPSI to, to, to develop a North America version or US version of the M65s to start collecting those numbers. So I think among, among all those things we could develop to Anthony's question, some of the preliminary framework, but it would be great to hear from everybody else, how can we accelerate that process too? Luke, thank you for that. That's a really good um, provocation to the room. And um, I'm hoping that some of those things will will definitely be touching on a little bit more with the updates from each of the working groups. Um, so I, I think that'll help fill in the gaps in terms of where we stand right now as a group and how we can start to think about Luke moving forward and incorporating some of those call to arms. Um, a question to Don and Anthony, or actually Don first, there was a question in the chat from Andrew at Amazon. Andrew, would you mind restating your question? It looks so maybe he stepped away. Um, would somebody else mind reading it out loud? My yeah, chat is I broken. I can go ahead and do that. Uh, what premium does the Inflation Reduction Act authorize for what reduction, uh, like dollars per ton? Mm -hmm. And that's not in there. I, I mean, it's very interesting that the language in the act is very concise and short. It does not give much detail. And uh, as far as I know, you know, there's there's not a government body that is doing the interpretation on this. So it's really up to agencies and their legal counsel and others. So it does not uh, uh, have any premium uh, for GSA for our uh, low embodied emission or the low greenhouse gas emissions uh, products. Uh, there was a lot of talk originally in developing the language that it would be incremental costs to try to get the uh, extra amount there. But for GSA to spend that much money that quickly, it has to cover the entire product for us. So uh, we have been interpreted that way and that seems fine with everybody. But uh, is is in terms of, yeah, what is substantially lower embodied carbon? We don't know that. That's what we're trying to figure out. 
Super. John, thank you. So a question to um, I, Luke, do you want to add? I see that you've got a quick note. <laughs> a couple of people in the room mentioned that within the <laughs> IRA that there was a tax credit mentioned at $180. That's for carbon like capture and $85 per ton on a pond source getting of the carbon dioxide out of the air and store. If you reuse them, then the number go lower. I think it's one, 130 bucks per ton for carbon capture. So if you if you reuse them. Well, I'm also curious if um, Andrew from Amazon is able to share that uh, uh, what the the sort what if, if or if anybody knows if Amazon's already shared it publicly what if they have a, a shadow tax internally for the cost of carbon and how that might compare to some of the other ways that people are starting to monetize the cost of carbon relative to tax rebates, incentives, the penalties that are being um, organized in in ordinances like New York's local and ninety seven, Boston's Brito two point et cetera. Uh, uh, it's quite a range from what I've seen across the board and would actually be pretty interesting to see if something like the IRA could uh, start to to coalesce more consistency around how it is that we're putting a dollar sign on that. Hey, Julie. Yes. Ah, you can hear me. Um, there's a few yeah. people on here that are having issues unmuting themselves, and I think Andrew's one of them, and I was one until I was able to get in with the link. So just when there's a silence, that might be what yeah. is happening. Okay. Nope. And do you have access to the chat? I do. Was okay. Andrew, right, were cool. you, possibly Andrew was just trying to I pipe can. up there. Nope, yeah. Can you hear there me? you are. We can, yeah. Oh. Sorry about that, Andrew. That's been quite a trial this morning. It really All has. Right. <laughs> let me, let me, let me see. Okay. Oh, now it wants access to my camera. Well, you don't really want to see. Me. Now you're muted. Andrew, you appear to be muted now. Not on Teams, but maybe like on another button on your headset or something. A real team effort this morning, you guys. Andrew, if you can hear us, please try again. <laughs> We would love to, we would love to hear your input. Yeah, Mercury, Mercury gone retrograde. It's true. And I, for those of you who are on the beginning of the Zoom call and know that I'm in this like impossibly tiny phone booth at WeWork, I hope you can see, I think the, the color of my face is actually probably a better indicator of the CO2 levels. I'm starting to feel very pink. <laughs> All right, cool. I have a question, Don, for you and Anthony. Well, hopefully, uh, Andrew, you've got your video on. Can I you? Think, yes. I think I'm finally right. working. All right. Okay. <laughs> you're you're all going to be incredibly disappointed by what I have to say. <laughs> but the, I was at, yeah, I was I was asking about a cost of carbon coming through the IRA because it's one of the most contentious issues, um, in in not only in Amazon but the other owner groups that were that were members of so we were we were hoping that there would be some federal federal guidance in the ira that we could that we could leverage um so i came all this way just to not answer your question there julie sorry <laughs> that's all right does uh, does amazon share if it has a an internal dollar number uh, no no okay cool i know there are other corporations that do so it would be it would be certainly very interesting to see, and maybe that's uh, you know it, the more noise we make about that and other things that are coming up as everybody's trying to wrap their heads around the um, 
the Inflation Reduction Act, I think the the more we should be asking for some of the dollars to go into a discussion that actually, you know, has a result of establishing a, a more cons some more consistency around the the cost of carbon. The EPA publishes a social cost of carbon, right? Like this is not there is a precedent for this type oh, of information being yeah. consolidated. So it it feels like it's a reasonable ask to to try to push forward. OMB publishes the social cost of carbon for the federal government. And uh, yeah, it's varied widely with administrations. Uh, but then in terms of how to apply that, uh, it's that's where it, there's it's, there's no clear guidance. And we, you know there was that one federal judge injunction for a while that it could not be applied to anything. So it's kind mm -hmm. of on again, off again. Uh, but Canada does use a shadow tax or a shadow price of carbon in a lot of their calculations and the work they do. And we've been talking with them about how that could help us as well. Well, just a just a note on the social cost of carbon. That number is assumed to be much more comprehensive and and potentially accurate uh, to display the true social cost of carbon, and it is far higher than a typical carbon offset per metric ton would be. Um, so thanks very much to the um, EPA and to other um, government institutions for doing that research years ago. It's really important to, to note that. In, in fact, uh, even though companies like Microsoft do do have a um, and apply an internal carbon tax uh, to drive all of their planning. That's really exemplary, but even that internal carbon tax doesn't nearly approach the social cost of carbon uh, that we've uh, we've seen um, information about from the from the federal government. Right, and then if you look at local law 97 or Berto 2.0, the dollar per metric ton is wildly higher than any of the numbers that are being talked about in the chat right now. So totally all over the map. But local law 97 is only after a certain threshold. Yep. Do you have to pay that amount? So it kind of makes sense that they jack it up. Fair. Well, I love what's happening in the chat. Keep that going. In the meantime, Don and Anthony, a question for you. Uh, you both it, you both sort of gave a nod to this in your presentations. Uh, the group of people on this call are doing um, are, are putting a lot of effort into organizing and coordinating um, knowledge communities and specific efforts and initiatives around embodied carbon for MEP systems. This is a pretty nascent space. I think everybody understands that the point of MEP 2040 is to co-create the rules of the game. Uh, so that we're all on the same page and we can move forward as quickly as possible. Uh, so we, you know, the initiative is is uh, is is underway. Uh, I think one of the key questions that I that I wanted to ask you is if you could be a bit more, if you could name some specific areas where it would be really valuable for your organizations. And Mick and Andrew, please feel free to 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 jump in as well. Um, what is the specific MEP related embodied? carbon items that are coming up or you want to see come up more so that we can incorporate that in the work that the working groups are doing. I can jump in first. So as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> so that section of money, the big chunk of money is for products or materials. And so if we are going to look at uh, mechanical systems or even individual chillers or whatever and try to get them funded under that, we would need something to show that there's lower embodied emissions. And we have some in GSA trying to argue, well, you know, you're going to save this much in GHG emissions anyhow with the efficiency of the product. So that should count. That's going to offset or that's, you know, exponentially higher, which might be true. But because of the wording, we really need to show the embodied carbon savings as well. So uh, with our backlog of work that we have, a lot of it is uh, replacing chillers and upgrading the equipment in buildings. And so we need some kind of uh, basis for saying, yes, this is acceptable to fund with that pot of money. So anything that would help in that line of thinking or getting the EPDs or some other way of showing that uh, certain products uh, or systems have lower embodied carbon than others that would is what we we really need 
Awesome. Uh, I think the, you know, the topic of refrigerants is one that gets us there and um, Kaylee and others will be talking about that in the working group updates. Um, BH has done a study and shown significant, Kaylee, correct me if I'm wrong, embodied carbon differences in uh, custom versus standard air handling units. Um, and the, you know, the conversation therefore that could happen with the manufacturers on standardizing more things that are typically put into this sort of custom category uh, to be able to capitalize on a lower carbon solution for ventilation systems and mechanical systems. And I'm and I'm wondering if there are other folks in the MEP 2040 community that have similar studies or things uh, we could, I think this forum would be a great place for us to collate some example uh, information, send it over to Don and see if Don also wants to maybe give us a little bit of funding to help him out. Uh, Anthony, Mick. Um, so just to add on. Um, Andrew, yeah, quickly, please. Um, the EPD is one piece of the, the puzzle, but it's also important to understand durability. In other words, uh, a simple uh, example is paint has a very low carbon footprint, but if it has to be repainted every two or three years, the footprint goes up. So does an air handling unit have a 25 year lifespan and then we have to take it to recycling or landfill or what, what's its life cycle? We need to understand the circular economy. In other words, does most of the stuff end up on landfill or does it, uh, can it be recycled or can it be reused? What's, what's going on there? And one of the tools we're using right now to understand that for other um, building products is triple bottom line cost benefit analysis. So you put a net present value onto a product um, in terms of lead, it would be 25 years. In terms of a public building, we use 40 years because 40 years is the lifespan of our buildings. And we try to understand what's the capital cost, what's the maintenance and operation cost, what is the cost for health um, or benefit for health and well-being of our passengers and our employees, what are the carbon costs. We put all this together, come up with an answer, and then we compare products. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at a bigger picture than just the EPD. Yeah, I, it's a good point. And I <laughs> I'm I apologize. I'm in the position of MC. I'm not trying to make a big sales pitch for BH, um, but rather contribute some of the things that I do know that we're doing in terms of initiatives. Uh, and I'm and I know for for I I I know that there are other companies doing very similar efforts. Um, so one one effort that I am aware of is uh, and is the work around a program called Design for Freedom, uh, which is also trying to understand the labor practices engaged in materials, uh, in addition to healthy product material declar declarations and an attempt on you know within the BH space. I'll shout out Kaylee again, and I'm sure many others uh, to actually create a tool that can access all of these different pieces of resources so that there can be more of a holistic decision making process, Anthony, like you're alluding to um, formalizing that and getting it to happen uh, sort of at scale is a huge challenge, but I think one that really makes sense to try to tackle. Um, I do know that there's a hand up, but before we get to that, uh, Andrew from Amazon and Mick. I'm wondering if you guys want to add anything in terms of the the specifics of what is going to be most valuable for your organizations. And Bill, thanks for your patience. Yeah. Hi, Julie. I'm happy to go first. I am. Oh, but Mick came on as well, so I'll defer to him if he's ready. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi everyone, um, Andrew Rhodes. I'm a senior program manager on the Worldwide Sustainable Buildings team here at Amazon. Um, we're a central resource, essentially an internal consultant for Amazon's real estate businesses. I'm um, working with um, all or most of our, our teams to make their buildings more sustainable. Um, Amazon co-founded the Climate Pledge in 2019, committing Amazon to be net zero carbon by 2040. So that's the North Star that we work from in, in all our sustainability work related to carbon. Um, 300 other businesses have followed and signed the pledge. Um, and I would definitely encourage your, your companies or institutions to take a look at um, climatepledge.com to see if it aligns with something that you're, the work that your businesses are doing already. Um, in addition to net zero carbon, Amazon has other public sustainability goals around shipment zero and, mm -hmm. and being 100% renewable powered by 2030. 
Um, we're currently the world's largest procurer of renewable power, and we see that that continuing. And we hope to have as much impact on um, other other industries related to sustainability as we do to renewables. So, um, yeah, very very happy to be here for this meeting this morning, and um, it's great to, great to see what everybody's up to. Super, Andrew. Thank you, Mick. Yeah, and I I really appreciate this is uh, such a fantastic forum and set of goals um, this is really incredibly important. I think in particular, um, you know, we have mainly urban constrained um, and historical buildings. And so to me, the the you know, the argument that your group makes that, um, you know, in the future, it's going to be about retrofitting. Uh, I, that's I believe that to be very much the case. And so looking at the embodied as well as the operational car, uh, carbon of MEP systems is going to become so much more important um, as we progress. And, and it's going to have to be, you know, a, a rapid retrofit um, as well. And so, you know, internally at USC, we're talking about, we're just beginning to talk about how do we actually train uh, our engineers to our, our mechanical engineers in particular to uh, really be experts in in this retrofitting space um, and what is it going to take uh, so uh, those conversations are just starting but we also recently launched our assignment earth sustainability framework uh, to carry us from now until the 2028 Summer Olympics in LA. Um, and so a lot of our goals are kind of centered around that date and what can we accomplish by that date. And so we did include goals around both uh, ensuring that every project from here on out has a, an LCA, uh, including you know embodied carbon analysis and actually looks, we just published new sustainable design and construction guidelines that um, also um, you know look for ways to reduce that embodied carbon. Um, and then also we have a professor, one of our goals is to conduct a historical embodied carbon analysis of the campus um, as a prelude to setting some kind of goal about offsetting that. And so we have a professor that's that's creating an experiential learning project with some students to actually do that calculation. So that's just kicking off right now too. So this is a space that I think is uh, incredibly important and is going to become more important as we continue in this uh, rapid escalation of the climate action. Awesome. Thank you so very much for jumping in, even though we didn't ask you to be formally a presenter. We really appreciate the feedback. Um, I, I will say I think one of the key things that I get excited about in this forum is essentially playing devil's advocate um, for the industry, right? So that we, as all of the professionals who are really engaged in this space, are are not necessarily just saying like things like heavy timber is better uh, without digging into the weeds and understanding when it's better, why it's better, how it's better, if it really is better, um, same thing with questions about system types, refrigerants, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to make sure that we don't get runaway perceptions on, on where this can go, and we really do the due diligence around it. Um, Bill, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really, I think, kind of in line with what you just said, and, and to really um, support what Anthony had mentioned um, it's really situational. It's it's easy to get lulled into looking at an absolute value of an EPD without understanding how it's going to be used. And and you know if you have if you're comparing two different types of systems where you have something that has a you know a life cycle of 15 years versus something that might be 30 or 40, you know you need to to account for the fact that you're going to have to replace that equipment. Um, within the same time span and double up on your on your EPD. And with the, you know, Don, when I mean, you talk about chillers, you know, you have, <clears throat> you know, water cooled chillers in with today's grid, 98% um, of the emissions come from the electricity that it'll use over its lifetime. That's going to change over time um, as the grid gets greener and, and, you know, if you you can purchase today centrifugal chillers with very low GWP refrigerants, so you can take that out of the equation right away. Um, but but you know, right now, the, probably having the energy efficiency in the next five or ten years might might overall be more important than than you know looking at a 
a, a lower embodied carbon piece of equipment, you know, in, in the long run. So it's it's very situational uh, and it's something that we have to really look at the sensitivity of all of these factors uh, in the context of the building uh, before we, we make these decisions. Yeah, I agree, Bill. I think there's a really powerful graphic that the Architecture 2030 crew has put together around the importance of embodied carbon compared to operational. Uh, and it's very true, but the nuances of each and every individual project we work on are also very true. And we found for some existing buildings that we're working on, the 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 embodied carbon value of the existing building is just not ever going to be enough to warrant its reuse compared to new construction because of the operational energy conversation. Obviously, massively different from an office to a lab to a healthcare setting. So the the intensity of the energy makes a huge difference, but the the level of nuance in the conversation is pretty significant. Yeah. Totally agreed. Um, the very last thing I want to do right now is cut this conversation short because I love where it's going and I'm hoping that we can find the right way to continue it. Um, so we're going to I think we're going to have to put our heads together, the steering committee, to see if if we can sort of bring this back and get some additional owners at the table. The questions and considerations and, and priorities that you're raising are. Um, I, I think really well aligned to what it is that that we all are really wanting to do. So it's really helpful to hear that, in fact, that those are the things that are most important to you. And I'll ask the folks um, who are going to share updates from the working groups uh, to try where, you know, where it makes sense um, to try to connect to some of those uh, ideas that we just heard Don, Anthony, Mick and Andrew raise. Um, and the last thing I'll do is give Andrew, um, Amazon via Andrew, a shout out um, specifically for uh, the two of the projects that we're working on with them in the Boston Seaport, where they instigated um, alongside the design team. It was just sort of a joint effort from from day one to go at, to actually move forward with the, 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 the next generation refrigerants in the chillers that are available today in the marketplace. So I wholeheartedly second that that is something that we can we can actively all do right now is to push for that technology it makes a huge difference. Um, all right. Does anybody have any final questions? Actually, I, did, I shouldn't do that. If you do, please put them in the chat. Um, I think we would like to really make sure that we we capture them and uh, make sure that that we can try to Put a plan together for what the best way is to continue to, to continue this conversation. Super helpful. So I'm going to share my screen again and uh, invite the next person, uh, people who are Adam and Christy, depending on who apparently continues to have access to unmute themselves at the moment. Um, so I will turn this back on. And Christy, it looks like it's you. I do have access. Okay. Adam, are you still down? Are you no, down? I'm, I'm here. You're good. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Super. Did you want to start, Adam? Yeah, I can kick off. Um, okay. So in our working group, uh, in the beginning, if you go to the next slide, Julie, we've we've organized around four primary goals for 2022, just to kind of get things aligned, and we've. Completed some and progress on some and some to come yet. So the first one is in our working group, we wanted to get manufacturers and EPD providers in our group, and we did that, and it's been very fruitful for us moving forward. Um, the next big goal that we've had is we wanted to be a consistent communication voice, um, you know, a credible source to the manufacturer commuter community on what we think we need to have in terms of information, what we think owners want to have and how we want that data to be formatted. So a communication channel, and Christy is gonna talk on that next. Um, so I'll let her speak to that. Our third goal was to have some live forums. Um, one of the first ones was to hear from owners. Manufacturers can hear from owners about what they're gonna want in the future. So that was in part met with this discussion. I think one of our next key spots is to give manufacturers a place to talk about all this. I think the request letters and what we're asking for there is a huge topic. And if we're relying on our manufacturer partners to help provide data toward us, we want to hear back from them what their struggles are, um, what the opportunities are, and just provide that through this group. 
And then finally, by the end of the year, I think this kind of will piggyback on on the letters. But if we're going to start specifying embodied carbon data for equipment, what's a common language we can all as MEP designers put in our specs so that manufacturers aren't getting requests from different spots and there's some consistency around that. So that's to be uh, developed. So those are our primary goals going forward and where we're at. And I'll let Christy go from there. Great, thanks, Adam. OK, so um, one of our first steps in providing a resource for others to be able to utilize um, and start making a call to action to manufacturers is um, a series of letter templates. Uh, the way that you access them right now is with the link at the top of this um, uh, slide, but I'd be really grateful, Julie or someone, if you could drop the link in the chat for everyone as well. Um, and the, the intent of the letters is to essentially not, uh, is to help you not have to recreate your own language. It, and so this is a starter template um, and the three topics um, or calls to action, as we're calling it, are looking for MEP equipment product transparency. So that's the first call to action. The second call to action is sustainable refrigerants for MEP systems. And the third call to action is subcontractor takeoff data. So um, we all know that MEP, MEP systems, um, there's not a ton of product transparency with regards to available EPDs out there. We were just having that conversation. So this is a call, this first one is a call asking MEP equipment folks to please provide that transparency. We, in the template, there are a couple pathways that we provide as suggested um, tracks for providing this product transparency. Again, this is a template designed to help you out so that you don't have to start from scratch. Um, but, you know, feel free to take this template and revise however it uh, really suits you and your relationship with your vendors. Um, the second call to action is to get more natural refrigerants, more equipment available for use with natural refrigerants on the market. Um, so this is a call to manufacturers to please uh, start developing, if they haven't already, pathways for their systems and equipment to be able to utilize natural refrigerants at, or low, ultra low GWP, ODP refrigerants. And then the third one, subcontractor takeoff data is essentially um, for um, a lot, primarily the static MEP system uh, equipment, ductwork, pipes, conduit, things like that. Um, where we don't have a good feel for a typical um, square footage of, con or not square footage, maybe linear footage of conduit in a typical size building. This is the kind of information that GCs use all the time to um, create estimates for construction projects. And so we're hoping to use this takeoff data as a way of understanding the MEP system um, information that we think we could calculate, you know, ductwork is a sing, you know, generally a singular, just a couple materials. We think we can come up with numbers to get an idea of what the embodied carbon impact of those materials are if we have takeoff data. So that's the third one. And that's it for those. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everybody uh, is able to to utilize those templates. Uh, we'd love to hear back from you if you are and you're getting positive or otherwise feedback uh, from the folks that you're sending it to. We, of course, can continue to, to evolve those templates to make sure that they're of best value to everyone. Um, but hopefully that also helps you all get a jump start on making connections and getting that that language out to all of your partners. Um, Kaylee, Kim, et cetera, could I hand the mic to you? To say it nicely. Hi everyone. Um, just to follow on from those letters finally being published, uh, Luke brought up the great point that it would be wonderful actually if GSA and SFO and Amazon joined us as partners and signing those letters and us really having some power behind us in 
producing those letters to manufacturers, requesting EPDs and low GWP refrigerants. And here's Luke. Luke, <laughs> Luke, Luke is in the video to take. And, and it's Luke, as you know, like, uh, I think we like to sing songs in harmony together. So if, if that's something that uh, can be done, that would be great too, if we can all sing the same song together in harmony. That's Excellent. All. So I think one of the action yeah. items that we'll take away as the MEP 2040 group is to follow back up with you all and other owners uh, to see if there's a, a joint signatory letter that we can put together sooner rather than later and get that sent around to all of our favorite manufacturers. Love it. Um, Bill McQuaid does have his hand raised. I don't know, Bill, if you wanted to add something to that. You're muted. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. OK, sorry. Um, <clears throat> the, the refrigerant one discussion has been a long one, and certainly as an industry, we've taken a long look at a lot of the natural refrigerants and um, where they can be used. Uh, a lot of the industry players have done it, um, but you got to be careful. You don't equate low GWP with high efficiency, um, and certainly there are certain uh, refrigerants that don't make sense from an efficiency standpoint in certain applications. And when you do that um, and when you use them, you actually go backwards because the operating um, emissions are such a, a large part of the equation. So be careful taking natural refrigerants as, as automatically meaning they're better um, in some environmental way. You've got to look at both their ODP, their G, their GWP, and their their efficiency within the cycle that you're using them in. Yep, totally agree, Bill and Kaylee. I think that's built into the refrigerant tool, correct? The efficiency piece is not, but Corey Duggan, who's a part of the working group, has done a couple of studies to help us out with facilitating that information. In addition to the questions on flammability, the ASHRAE 228P guidance has a you know, metrics sit alongside the refrigerant choice. It's a multi-layered decision and we're not, um, you know, we're aware of that. Super fact. cool. We, we look to our manufacturers to help us out with that decision at the end of the day. Um, so switching over to the data analysis and reporting working group, we've been working really hard on several different initiatives. Um, but for those who are not familiar with this group, it's the largest of the working groups. I think we have 50 or 60 um, people who are a part of this group. Uh, so part of that is working on the reporting progress as a part of establishing a company plan. So we are working with AIA DDX to try to integrate refrigerants first, since we know that sitting that alongside the operational carbon is a great first step and one that we can really um, take action on. Uh, requesting low GWP refrigerants, we've got the, the letter now that Christy just presented, and then requesting EPDs. Another piece there, this group is working to be able to come up with guidance uh, for the application of those. So if we go to the next slide, Julie. Um, since the last time we met together, the refrigerant impact tool has actually gone live. So if you go to that um, web link, you'll find the tool available to you. This has all of the leakage data sets that are uh, available that we know of um, in the industry. We're happy to add others to this if we need to. Um, so the link associated with the equipment and conference and lots of conversations about refrigerant <laughs> leakage have come up. Um, one of which being that at end of life, it just all gets vented to atmosphere, which is disconcerting in many ways. So um, there's potentially more impact even than this tool picks up. So really just giving everyone here um, an idea of what that impact is, but also a quick tool to be able to utilize with clients, manufacturers to make better decisions um, more readily on our projects. Um, next slide. Super, Kelly, and I'd love to talk to you about if and how operational uh, the efficiency of the equipment using those refrigerants can be incorporated in the next version. Yeah, I think adding in more um, attributes, I guess, of that decision making process would, would be great. Yeah. Super. And your audio is cutting up a little bit. I Definitely don't know if it's just me. <laughs> um, 
sorry about the, the audio bit. Um, another big piece of this is working on BIM protocols. So understanding what exactly the impacts are of MEP systems. And we can only measure certain things because we don't have EPDs. So uh, two of those areas where we've chosen to focus, first being refrigerants. So whether that's from the charge of the equipment listed in your schedule, or from the piping um, in your systems, which is not often modeled. Um, so focusing more on the charge of the refrigerants. And then on the system side, really just starting to get duct and pipe takeoffs for different building topologies, different system types, um, different pipe materials, and looking at what good looks like in that space. Again, multifaceted decision, um, different properties associated with those I mean, insulations around pipes and ducts. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see a little piece of the guidance that we're starting to come up with there, just in terms of how you would go about that LCA, um, looking to our structural colleagues for guidance in that space in terms of how to even through something that the um, LCA practitioners of Bear Hobbled at least have a lot of experience doing. So uh, providing that same guidance around MEP. And then I'm going to hand it over actually to Ante to go over the operational target. Hey, everybody. Um, so in addition to uh, the, all the embodied and material stuff that Kaylee just mentioned, we're also trying to develop a cohesive way to just report the operating emissions. You know, a, a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour, but the carbon varies regionally. And we even within in the group have a lot of opinions about whether we should be using uh, this aggregate regional level eGrid data like you get out of Portfolio Manager, or should we be looking at the Hourly trends. Uh, uh, really understanding, you know, the way some an off building in a in there. You know, we're just trying some info about how people do this, what they think is the the best standard, and then hopefully that becomes a set of guidelines for firms who want to start uh, reporting this stuff in, in a way that they um, from the grid to our refrigerant emissions, and then all the stuff that we're specifying and installing in buildings as well. Super, thank you. Um, that's two out of four working groups. I'm going to hand uh, the mic over to Andrew and Rob for number three, our communications working group for an update. Great. This is Rob Boland from Integral. I'm going to sort of fly through this uh, because we are uh, quickly running out of time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so we've continued to be active within the communications team. Uh, I've got a list of our core team members there in the meetings that we've had since the last forum. Next slide, please. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, th there was a, a big effort uh, previously to uh, organize this uh, website. Uh, it is still a work in progress. We do want to encourage all of our supporters, uh, all of our signatories and others to visit. And uh, hopefully those of you who are not signatories or supporters, please join us. Please sign up. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to that, we have a resources page that uh, it continues to be there. There's a lot of great information that uh, has been dropped in here already. Uh, and as you've heard earlier, there there is a you know, we're, we're certainly uh, desirous of people submitting information to us so that that can be, get populated. Uh, we do realize that there is some organizational issues that we're uh, going to be working through to the end of the year to to better organize our resources page because there's just a ton of information that we're trying to share with signatories and supporters. Uh, next slide, please. And as a result of that, we actually do have an outreach slide. So if somebody has, whether it's a case study, uh, a, a, a research report, a white paper related to MEP 2040. There is a way for you to get that to us uh, through this particular format, attaching the document. Then it goes through a, a, a kind of a technical review uh, before we actually post it onto the website. So we uh, please encourage uh, all of you uh, who have relevant information you want to share with the rest of the community to get that information to us. Uh, next slide, please. Rob, uh, you're cooking. <laughs> and as just a reminder, we're continuing to, to develop content for our signatories, uh, whether it's uh, the technical resources that we're posting from the other working groups, or whether it's graphical information, just to help, help share this information, whether through social media postings, press releases, et cetera, right? We wanna be there as a resource uh, to help all of our signatories and supporters continue to spread the word. Gonna turn it over to Stefan in partnerships. 
Awesome. Right. Rob, thank you for that. That's an amazing amount of work and even more amazing to be compressed into, I think, actually two minutes. So thank you for that. And um, I, we are recording, so everybody will have a chance to go back through that and play it at half speed if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, over to you. All right. Well, hopefully I'll take less time than that, but I'd like to thank <laughs> Today's uh, presenters, if you go to the next slide, because I think one of the reasons we scheduled this particular topic for forum number three is because of a comment that rose uh, to the surface in our working group session, which is that we need to help owners create the demand uh, from the manufacturers to provide the EPD data that we're all looking for. And I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, mention one uh, partnership uh, possibility here where we need some volunteers. Um, as you can see, uh, perhaps you can't, um, the typical project team members are listed in this first oval that you're noticing to the right of the way in which embodied carbon, uh, carbon can be addressed in an action plan uh, for owners, and we're missing the MEP uh, column. And um, if you could go to the next slide, uh, I'll acknowledge also that SFO and GSA, I think, are members of the Owners Can uh, board uh, under Building Transparency, which is a wonderful resource. And another comment that rose to the surface in our working group was just the need for a holistic approach. And so we thought that helping the next draft of this um, uh, action plan would be a great opportunity for maybe a dozen of us to be involved in in terms of developing the content. And so if you're interested, please go ahead and put your name in the chat or let the um, uh, the steering committee members know. And we'd love to sort of understand, you know, how we can add this uh, information. And I have a question for Anthony, actually, because you talked about the importance of commissioning and under operations down here, there's very little, I think, in the current action plan. But I believe that when it comes to MEP systems, in particular refrigerants, that's probably a really critical piece uh, of an owner's, I think, action plan. That is exactly correct, and we have a whole program of how buildings get handed over at the end of construction so that we <clears throat> can ensure that these buildings perform as high performance buildings going forward. I'd love to talk with you a little bit more about that. Yeah, give um, me a call thank sometime. You. Thank you. Yes, great. Thanks. And uh, Kaylee, I'm not sure if you want to talk about mindful materials at all. That's another opportunity emerging. Sure. Um, so Mindful Materials has uh, joined to part of the AIA Common Materials Framework. So the AIA adopted that, and that is the holistic framework that's, um, you know, LCA, EPD, embodied carbon indicators, in addition to um, healthy materials, which Mindful Materials is best known for, as well as things like the uh, modern slavery metric. So the social impact of the products that we select so that we can actually make a, a good choice in a well-rounded way. So Annie Bevan is leading that. Super. If you are not currently one uh, part of one of these working groups, please do sign up. Uh, Andrew, I think maybe we could send another round of reminder for folks to do that. Somehow we can talk about what the right logistics are. Um, for that, but the these groups are doing an enormous amount of work and the, the more folks that are involved, the faster we can go and the more impact we can have. And it's really, really excellent to have all of the diversity of input and experience and thought that's coming around the table for all of these topics. So thank you, an immense thank you to everybody who's currently active in these working groups and, uh, and another plea to please volunteer. Rob has said, has seconded that in the chat and uh, and Kim has actually provided a link for where you can sign up. So please use that link uh, to sign up and join the effort. Um, we do not have time for additional discussion. I apologize uh, and to end on time, which I do think we are going to do to respect everybody's time. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, thank you so very much to, uh, to the presenters for joining and and giving your time today. We know that you're very busy. Everyone is slammed with uh, meetings and, and everything these days. So thank you again for your time, for joining us. Um, we'll, we'll definitely be following up with you to see what we can do to continue to support the work that you're doing and uh, join up with some other owners to continue to support the industry on this topic. Kim, Stefan, other steering committee members, anything you wanna say? Andrew, you usually have a very nice parting. <laughs> I'm just this.
astounded that this worked actually. So we ended up um, with a, a pretty successful meeting. Uh, we had a total of approximately 75 attendees, which is, is down a bit from the last quarterly meeting, uh, purely because of the logistics uh, problems that we had early on. Uh, but we did have 170 people sign up for this meeting originally, and that was a good 30, 35% above the registrants for the previous quarterly forum. So I'm just e extremely excited by what I've heard this morning. I really appreciate all of the attendees uh, that we've had and the great um, contributions that we've had from so many of you. We will be publishing the video recording of this meeting on the MEP2040.org website, and I'll send out a link to that web to that recording to everybody who attended, uh, everybody who registered, even if they weren't able to join us with a Teams meeting a little bit later on. So thank all of you so much for being here this morning. Uh, from Carbon Leadership Forum, we're just ex we're really inspired and excited by what we're looking at, uh, the degree of leadership and contribution and innovative ideas that are coming from so many of you. This is a great example of a collective impact initiative. So congratulations to the steering committee and thank everybody for attending this morning. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks again to everyone for joining. Um, and I, the very last thing we'll say is that these forums are for all of us. So if you have any comments or ideas about what you think would be most helpful for these forums, most engaging, um, you know, uh, or for the working groups, please share those ideas. Um, this is for all of us. Julie, oh. before you drop, there are a number of amazing resources that were put in the chat during this conversation. Yep. Can we capture them and yes. send them yep. out? Thank Absolutely. You. you got it. Super. Happy Thursday, everyone. One more note. Just okay. last <laughs> Sorry, just last night we had number 50 in the list of MEP design firms that have joined this initiative. Fantastic. Hurrah. Excellent. Number 100, here we come. All right. Congratulations, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.